Welcome back to The Knife Life. Today we're sitting down and talking with Michael Janich, head instructor and founder of Marshall Blade Concepts. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, just for the people who don't know who you are, can you give us a little bit of a background on your martial arts experience? I've uh, been involved in martial arts since I was a teenager. Kind of got into it when I was about 12, 13 years old. Started off in boxing, uh, went into a martial art called American Self-Protection, or ASP, which is kind of a, a hybrid art of uh, elements of Judo, Aikido, Savat, and Western boxing. Um, joined the military right out of high school, um, served nine years active duty, and during that time trained with a bunch of different people all over the place. So kind of an eclectic background, training with, with different folks. Um, probably my strongest training influence was in the Filipino martial arts. Uh, so I'm an instructor in uh, Serrata Escrima, uh, Filipino Serrata Escrima uh, from the Angel Cabalas lineage. But um, probably the greatest um, period of influence that I had, um, I was the video production manager for Paladin Press from 1994 to 2004. And during that time, got to work with some truly world-class martial artists. So for me, it was not only an opportunity to produce videos about their information, but in the process, got to kind of crawl inside their heads to make sure that I was accurately representing what they wanted to convey as far as their, their systems. So um, it really was kind of almost a graduate level uh, education in martial arts, working with people like uh, James Keating, Kelly McCann, Joe Simonette, Chris Petrelli, uh, just literally a, a list of world-class martial artists. And for me, that was one of the, the most educational and beneficial times. So um, just been involved in the martial arts for a very, very long period of time. And um, over time have gra gravitated toward uh, specifically edge weapon skills and counter edge weapon skills. So as you're the creator of Martial Blade Concepts, you're probably the best person out there to actually explain what is Marshall Blade Concepts to the person who actually has never encountered it before. So what is Marshall Blade Concepts? Marshall Blade Concepts, or MBC for short, um, is essentially my approach to using edge weapons for self-defense. Okay, so when you look at edge weapon um, stuff that has evolved throughout history, um, anytime that you have a martial art, you have to put that art into context as far as why it was developed, what it was designed to do at that period in time. So when you look at uh, Japanese martial arts, when you look at Kenjutsu and things like that, uh, certainly you look at the historical era of the samurai, what they were trying to do, what they were trying to achieve, and essentially how their tactics and their weaponry serve that goal. When you look at uh, the Filipino martial arts historically, especially during the periods where they were fighting against the Spaniards as an invade, invading force, or they were using the Filipino martial arts against the Japanese in World War II. Again, what you had was a system of tactics, but you also had a specific contextual application for that stuff. The problem when it comes to modern self-defense, and especially when you take knives into the context of modern self-defense, is that people will try to take things that were appropriate for another place in time, and immediately plug them into modern self-defense as far as, okay, I'm going to use this. If, if somebody attacks me on the way to the ATM, I'm going to fight like I'm a Filipino warrior on the battlefield a few hundred years ago. That's inappropriate. And the tactics are inconsistent with the requirements of modern self-defense. So what I've done with NBC is I've essentially taken things that, from a technique standpoint, are well-established as, as having been effective, but then putting that into the context of, hey, I need to be responsible and be able to justify my actions in modern self-defense and be able to do it with a knife that I can actually carry legally and conveniently in the modern world. So it's taking things that have been historically proven, but then plugging them into that modern self-defense context. Excellent. So where did the idea for Marshall Blade Concepts really originate from? What's interesting is Marshall Blade Concepts and Counter Blade Concepts, Empty Hand Defense Against Knives, those two kind of evolved simultaneously. But actually, the CBC, the Counter Blade Concepts part, came first. When I was studying my first formal martial art, American Self-Protection, we were learning defenses against knives. And I had several training partners who were kind of like-minded like me. They were like, you know, hey, let's really push our training and try to be intense and try to make it as realistic as possible. And what we found was the counter knife techniques we were doing sucked. They were just anytime you try to do anything with any kind of intensity, any kind of level of realism, they fell apart very quickly. 
So I went to my instructor and I said, hey, our counter knife techniques suck. I want something better. And he said, well, if you want to learn how to defend against a weapon, learn how to use the weapon. I'm like, okay, great. Let's do knife fighting. And he was a former Army Ranger. He had some military knife training. He taught us what he knew, which wasn't a whole lot. And this was mid-1970s. So one of my other training partners, right around that time, it was some of the first books that were published on knife fighting since World War II came out in the mid-1970s. Complete Book of Knife Fighting by William Cassidy and Secrets of Modern Knife Fighting by David Steele. Um, he said, hey, you should check out these books. I found out about them through this magazine called Soldier of Fortune. Soldier of Fortune was just starting to be published at that time. So there I was, 13 years old. I started buying Soldier of Fortune, started buying these books and everything, started doing the research. And the real goal was to be able to defend against knives because it was one of the things that scared me the most was being attacked by somebody with a knife. Um, but in the process, again, following the wisdom of my instructor, learn how to use the weapon so you can learn how to defend against it. So over time, what ended up happening, those two happened kind of hand in hand, um, especially once I went into the military, especially once I was working overseas, even though you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, bring a knife to a gunfight, all this other kind of stuff. I was living in situations where I couldn't own a gun, let alone carry a gun for self-defense. So even though the whole concealed carry part of it is a very compelling argument, in my situation, the knife was the tool of choice. It was what I could legally carry, it was what I could have with me, um, and it became one of those things, especially in the context where I was working, um, having a self-defense weapon that was capable of lethal force was worthwhile. And that's really what kind of pushed the development of the whole thing was, you know, I had a viable need for it, and that was the, the reasonable and the, the um, available tool of choice. So let's actually delve into the logic of MBC a little bit. What is it that you look at specifically that sets you apart from other bladed systems that are available out there? NBC is all about logic. So part of my, like my military background, <clears throat> I was a Vietnamese and Chinese Mandarin linguist, and I was also an intelligence analyst for the National Security Agency. So I was trained to analyze things, look at things logically, and that kind of applies across the board to everything I do in life. When it came to taking things from the traditional Filipino martial arts, which is the strongest influence as far as the edge weapon skills, and being able to apply that to self-defense, it's like, okay, let's be logical about it. So first of all, you're going to fight with the knife you actually carry. So it may be fun to train with Bowie knives. It may be tr fun to train with you know, tomahawks and all that kind of stuff. But what do you actually have in your pocket on a daily basis? So whatever that knife is, whatever you can legally carry, which ideally you want to be in legal compliance with your local laws and everything, whatever that is, that is what you're really going to fight with. Based on that reality, you also have to look at that weapon and say, okay, what can this thing realistically do? So if I've got a knife with, like, for example, here in Colorado, three and a half inch blade, what kind of damage can it cause? Being able to quantify that and have a, a realistic understanding of whatever that is, is really important. So you're going to fight with the knife you actually carry, understand and quantify the destructive power of your actual carry weapon. And what you need to do is focus on stopping power. So when you look at modern self-defense, lethality, the idea of killing somebody, it doesn't take that much to kill somebody, but what you want is the ability to stop somebody from trying to kill you as quickly and efficiently as possible. It doesn't make sense if I cut somebody and they bleed out five minutes later, but in the meantime, they're able to kill me and bash my head in with a hammer or whatever it might be. I still haven't achieved the desired goal. So okay. achieving stopping power becomes huge. And in order to do that, what you have to have is a realistic understanding of human anatomy and how knives stop reliably and predictably. So I know that I'm going to carry a particular knife. I know what its destructive capacity is. I know that I have to use it to stop somebody quickly and efficiently. What do I cut or puncture on another person to make that happen as quickly as possible? And then what I also want to do is in that process, make sure that I take into consideration natural instinct, how people react to things under stress, and be able to plug that into things and make sure that whatever techniques I'm using, that I'm not coming up with something that is so contrived and so difficult to learn that there's a very steep learning curve. I want it to be natural human action as much as possible. And I also want to make sure that I can 
have a training methodology that allows me to develop reliable skills under stress. So essentially a progressive training methodology that allows you to get in lots of repetition, repetitions under scalable stress so you have reliable skill when you need it. Mm -hmm. So digging into that a little bit more, um, going into looking at the human physiology. Um, on your website you talk about biologic, uh, biomechanical targeting, if mm -hmm. I get the term all, terminology right. What exactly do you uh, mean by that and why is that so important to stopping power that you were just talking about? Okay. Again, if we go back to the logic, if we look at, let's say that this is a knife that you can legally carry, so about a three and a quarter inch blade. <clears throat> you look at this and you say, okay, I can take um, if we use a target that we use called pork man, for example, um, three to five pound pork tenderloin, butterfly, wrapped around a, a wooden dowel rod, tied on with a bunch of twine, wrapped with a bunch of plastic. What you have is something that gives you something about the size of the upper arm, uh, certainly gives you something about the size of the forearm here, or even the lower leg. So representative targets that end up becoming the key targets in NBC. I can cut any of these targets to the bone with this knife. So I can quantify and understand that's the level of damage that I can cause. <clears throat> well, now what you want to look at is how do I stop somebody? So if you imagine you're being attacked by somebody with a contact distance weapon. Guy's got a tire iron. He's trying to bash your head in with a tire iron. You've got to make him stop with your knife. What it comes down to is you look at what targets are available to you, what targets can you cut, and which ones will give you the quickest debilitating response based on your actions. So if somebody's swinging a, tar uh, a weapon at your head, one of the things they're giving you first of all is essentially the inside of the wrist, inside of the forearm here. So the way that people grip weapons is the flexor muscles of the forearm contract, they pull on the tendons in the wrist, those go through the wrist to the fingers and that's how your hand closes to make a fist, that's what allows you to grip a weapon. So cutting those tendons you literally mechanically disconnect these muscles from the fingers, you disarm the person. You cut the muscles deeply enough, you get the same response. The muscles can't contract, the hand opens, they drop the weapon. In the Filipino martial arts, they call it defanging the snake. This is the snake, the fang is the actual weapon. So the idea of somebody trying to hit you in the head, they're giving you the best possible target you could hope for by extending it toward you. So bypassing that, saying I'm gonna block this and I'm gonna stab this guy in the chest, or I'm gonna try to cut his neck, whatever it might be. This is the real threat. So eliminating that threat at its source and doing so by requiring a very shallow cut that is easy to achieve because I'm sticking it out and holding it out for you, that makes the most sense. So that becomes our first priority. When we look at the second priority, essentially the better that I can wield this weapon, the more dangerous I am to you. I'm trying to hit you with that tire iron. So I need to extend and bend my elbow I want to hit, I want to draw it back, I want to hit you again, and essentially repeat that process. Well, if you can take away that mechanical process by cutting the tricep muscle, which extends the elbow, or cutting the bicep, which bends the elbow, then what you've done is you've seriously limited his ability to wield that weapon effectively. In the process, what we also look at is, for example, a cut going through the bicep here. What you have in addition to the mechanical level of stopping power, we have three levels of stopping power in NBC. One is the mechanical part, which is muscles and tendons. The second one is the neurological part, specifically peripheral nerves. For me to do anything with my arm, my brain is sending electrical impulses through the nerves to the muscles of my arm to make it move. When you cut the nerve, you immediately disconnect the brain from the muscle and it can't initiate that action anymore. So cutting the bicep, if you cut here, you can cut the bicep itself and take away the bending of the elbow, but you can also cut the nerves that control the rest of the arm and also control the grip. So again, immediate debilitation of that limb. And the ultimate go-to we have is cutting the quadricep muscle just above the knee. Um, basically, the quadricep muscle at the front of the leg is what extends your knee joint and allows you to support weight. If you cut that, the knee collapses, the person drops, and at that point, you can create distance and they can't follow you. As long as you can run faster than they can hop, you're in good shape. If you can't cut both of them, and they, they won't hop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but essentially what we look at is, is being able to target those specific things that literally cripple somebody very, very quickly. We're taking the Filipino concept of defanging the snake, and we're not just limiting it to here, we're literally taking it to other body parts that will completely disable somebody and stop them decisively. 
And then there's also the legal aspect of things as well, which you have taken into account with these targets as well. So why are these targets, which are physiologically effective, also beneficial to target in a legal aspect as well and help keep you out of jail, essentially, and a free man? Great question. Again, when, it, when you look at the traditional Filipino stuff, for example, what they'll do in a lot of cases is they'll cut here to defang the snake. So you see a lot of Filipino knife technique where they'll cut this, they might add a disarm of some sort or something like that to ensure that the person drops the weapon, and then they follow up to lethal targets. So I cut your wrist, and then I cut your throat, and I stab you in the torso. When you look at that from a Filipino battlefield application, a few hundred years ago with a Spaniard makes sense, okay? Because they're literally looking at it as warfare. When you look at it from the concept of modern self-defense, you have to look at justifying your actions in court. And these days, the number of video cameras out there, the number of you know CCTV cameras and all that kind of stuff, the odds of your actions in self-defense being documented by somebody somewhere on video are pretty high. Even if they're not... If you are in any way associated with your handiwork, you're going to have to justify your actions. So if you look at it and say, okay, I cut this guy's wrist, he dropped his knife, or he dropped his tire iron, whatever else it might be. And then at that point, I cut his carotid artery and I stabbed him in the torso. You went from justifiable self-defense where he's attacking you with a lethal weapon. You're justified in producing your own lethal weapon because you're in fear for your life or in fear of grievous bodily injury, what it takes for you to cross the threshold to the use of a lethal weapon. And then what you did was he attacked you, you defended, but in the process, you cut him and you disarmed him. He dropped his weapon. At that point, he's no longer a lethal threat, unless there's a severe disparity of size and strength where you could say he was still a lethal threat to me. In most cases, that won't be the case. <clears throat> you disarmed him, and then you continued to use your knife with lethal force against a now unarmed person. So if you train in the Filipino martial arts and you train that way, disarm and then kill, and you behave that way in self-defense, what's going to end up happening is you will be considered the aggressor. At the point I disarmed you, I'm done. I'm safe because I've stopped the lethal threat. I'm no longer justified in using a lethal weapon. When I then attack you by cutting your carotid artery, sticking you in the torso, I went from justifiable self-defense to assault with a deadly weapon to attempted murder to potentially murder in a very short period of time. And the old saying is, you'll fight the way you train. Well, if you train to do things that way, and then you're forced to defend yourself, you're also training yourself to go to prison. Mm -hmm. And then even afterwards, uh, physiologically, even those attacks against the neck or the internal organs isn't going to get you that much in terms of defending yourself as well in the short term, That's which one is of really the, what matters. One of the key things about NBC, one of the one of the opportunities that I had, like when I first started researching knife technique and everything, and researching um, the destructive capacity of the knife. You go back to World War II. W. E. Fairburn wrote a book called All In Fighting. Later published as Get Tough, and in there he had a thing called the timetable of death. Okay, so the timetable of death supposedly it listed all the the key arteries of the body. So carotid artery, subclavian artery, aorta, femoral artery, brachial artery, all that type of stuff. And supposedly, how long it would take for somebody, when that artery was severed, to cut, uh, to bleed to unconsciousness and then bleed to death. All that information in there was never medically validated, was never scientifically validated, and best we can tell, it's all bullshit. Okay, it was basically designed to instill confidence in soldiers during World War II. But from a realistic standpoint, none of it was valid. One of my students, a guy named Chris Gross, who was a Littleton police officer, he was a master instructor for PPCT, uh, which is one of the law enforcement defensive tactics programs. And they used Fairburn's timetable as a reference. Chris asked me, is that valid? Is it scientifically valid? And my understanding was that it wasn't. So Chris worked with the Denver Medical Examiner and basically did the research with vascular surgeons to figure out how long it really took. For example, Fairburn said, if you cut somebody's common carotid artery, so you have two carotid arteries, one on each side, where you'd feel the pulse in your neck, supposedly, according to Fairburn, you cut that, and five seconds later, the person is unconscious. That's bullshit, okay? Realistically, what it comes down to, this is 7.5% of your blood flow. That has to bleed enough for a person to lose 30% of their total blood volume, which on average is going to be about two liters, 
they're going to have to lose that much blood to bleed to unconsciousness. That actually takes well over a minute, even at elevated heart rate. And Fairburn never took heart rate into, into consideration. So Chris basically did the research to disprove Fairburn's information. And he and I worked together. We submitted a white paper to PPCT for them to remove that reference, the timetable of death, from uh, their curriculum. And also it ended up becoming a book called Contemporary Knife Targeting, where we basically documented that. The bottom line is bleeding people out, although it can be definitely an application of lethal force, it doesn't stop them quickly enough to be useful in self-defense, which is why we focus on muscles and tendons and the nervous, uh, nervous system side of it. What's also interesting about this, when you look at, and one of the things that I've done is, I've had people approach me and say, okay, we want you to be an expert consultant for a legal case in which a knife was used in self-defense. When you start looking at the way that knife-related incidents are documented in uh, the legal system, documented by the medical system, by coroners and stuff like that during autopsies, what you'll see in there, 99% of what they see is the felonious use of knives. So their mindset and their, their perspective of things is very much tainted by that. So what they see is any kind of cuts on the hands or anything like that, those are defensive wounds. So whoever had the cuts on their hands followed by typically puncture wounds somewhere else or deep cuts somewhere else, they tried to defend themselves, they weren't successful, they were killed. Mm -hmm. That pattern, when you look at that, what it means is if you're actually gonna defend yourself, what you want is your work product, for lack of a better word, to justify your actions in self-defense and to look distinctly different from the felonious use of a knife. So a lot of people will say, well, you know, the best way to learn knife fighting is to look at what they do in prison. It's like, well, in prison, they're typically killing each other with knives. It ends up not being a self-defense type of thing at all. It's one person killing somebody else. It's prison. It's prison. Yeah. Exactly. So the idea of somebody stabbing somebody repeatedly in the torso which is what you'll see in the felonious use of knives as far as criminal assaults on the street, what you'll see in prison, all that kind of stuff. Definitely effective as far as killing people, not effective as far as stopping people, and certainly not effective as far as a justifiable use of force in self-defense. Because if you behave like a criminal, you'd be considered like a criminal. You're not only going to solve your, your problem much more slowly than you could through other means, but also the, the system is going to look at you and say, yeah, this was a felonious use of a knife, because that's what they're used to seeing. So when it comes to using a knife as a defensive weapon, you not only have the practicalities of how do I actually save my life with this thing and use it effectively, but also how do I justify my actions and how do I separate myself from being considered a criminal because I ended up using a knife as a, as a defensive weapon. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of, there's a lot of considerations when it comes to using a knife defensively. Um, and it's not just the practicalities of, oh, what technique do I use? Uh, literally the entire, entire legal system is kind of stacked against you. So you've got to take that into consideration when it comes to choosing your proper tactics. So one of the things that you mentioned as well is being able to get a high number of repetitions in during your practice session. So how do you achieve that? Repetition is a mother of all skill. So when you think of, okay, my partner attacks me, I do a particular technique, okay, great, I attack him, he gets his rep. It's an inefficient way to to get in lots of reps and you're never really getting to that point to where you're amped up. You don't really have that adrenaline flowing. You don't have that performance anxiety. So one of the things that's inherent in the Filipino martial arts is what they call flow drills or reflex training drills. Um, and in a lot of cases, what those are are counter for counter drills. So it's the idea of I attack, my partner defends his counter to me. I then defend against that. I counter him. He defends against that. What you get is this cyclical uh, repetitions of critical skills. So these drills are designed to isolate specific skills and be able to allow you to get in lots of repetitions on those specific skills in a short period of time. And as you get better and better at them, the speed increases, the intensity increases, you can add other things like footwork and stuff like that into it, and essentially it becomes kind of a battle of wills between you and your partner as you do this. And what you're able to do is to literally go from basic mechanical competency with the drills up to the point to where your heart is racing, you have a high level of performance anxiety, um, and we also introduce elements of 
randomness or unpredictability into the drills that forces you to pull out specific reflexes. So it becomes a really dynamic training method that also simulates that adrenal rush. When it comes to being attacked, nothing really accurately simulates the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response. That is something that is a very special human reaction. Closest we can come is to challenge people at a very high physical level uh, and a very high anxiety level to try to simulate that SNS activation. But what it allows you to do is to go from the point of, okay, I kind of got this technique and I'm kind of comfortable with it, to, hey, I'm practicing this many, many times in a very short period of time at a high level of intensity. And that's what gives people not only a much more reliable skill, but also just a faster learning curve overall because they're getting in the reps they need. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that I encounter when I show videos of the flow drills to other people, it's like, that's just fight. That's just whoever gets cut the most, uh, everybody loses in that entire situation. That's not actually the applications of the martial blade concept. That's no. you just getting the motions and drilling in the responses in, and then you incorporate those into the actual applications that you would encounter and actually use with the knife, correct? Exactly. Well, what it comes down to with the drills, people will look at that and say, well, that's not how people really fight. Exactly. Yeah. Okay? So it's just like when you have a boxer who's working on a heavy bag. You're not going to have somebody who's going to stand there like this and let you punch them. Okay? What it is, you're working on specific aspects of technique. A boxer hitting a speed bag, nobody's head is going to bounce back and forth like that. So why are you doing that? You're Again, you're using a training methodology that develops and isolates specific skills. And then once you understand how those skills are applied, you have to get far enough down that road, down that learning curve to be able to understand that. People mm -hmm. who dismiss it, they don't really know what they're looking at. They don't understand how it applies. And specifically in MBC, one of the other things that we've looked at and how it differs from traditional Filipino martial arts is that in a traditional Filipino martial arts, in a lot of cases, you'll be doing drills and stuff like that where you learn the drill but they really don't apply that back to the application. In MBC, I specifically chose the drills that we do to make sure that it is always reinforcing actual application and technique. So what's interesting is you'll get a student, you'll get them to the point to where they're doing the drill and they're like, okay, great. I, I, I feel more comfortable with this, but I don't really know what I'm doing. And it's like, okay, great. You learn how to do a defense against an angle one, and then you did... Let's say one, four, three, two. When we look at a sequence of angles, I did a one, I did a low backhand angle four, I did a three, I did a two. Okay, great. I did that in the drill, but I don't know what it means. Then you teach them a technique, do a meet for an angle one. Oh, I cut and checked here, I thrust into the armpit, I cut out through the bicep, and then I cut the tricep. Oh, wait a minute. All the movements that I did, all the body mechanics that I learned through hundreds of repetitions of that drill, Suddenly, when I put those into a technique, it's as if the technique is effortless. Because, again, you burned in the body mechanics. You got the reps to have that mechanical fluidity. Again, what it comes down to is being able to get far enough in the skill progression to understand where the drills benefit. So it used to be, even when I first founded MBC and started teaching MBC, a lot of the traditional Filipino stuff, a lot of traditional martial arts stuff, you would learn a drill first or you'd learn a form first. So you'd be doing this drill and it's like, I'm doing this, but I don't really know what I'm doing. You go back to the karate kid, wax on, wax off type of, of thing. Or as we jokingly call it, wax on, whack off in NBC. Because if you don't know what you're doing, you might as well be jerking off because it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But when you put that into context and you suddenly realize, hey, wait a minute, what I'm really doing is this, this, this. I actually ended up totally changing the teaching methodology of NBC because it was no longer about... You know, I learned the Filipino martial arts and essentially applied um, the use of the knife into what I learned. Back when I learned it, Filipino, traditional Filipino martial artists would not teach non-Filipinos knife technique. It's just they wouldn't teach it outside their culture. So I took the stick technique, applied the analytical process to it, and essentially came up with MBC. In the process initially, what I did was, hey, let's learn a drill and then we'll dissect the drill and show you how it applies into technique. What that meant was that people still had to go through the wax on, wax off process of learning a drill before they learned anything useful. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
you know what, I'm not bound to the Filipino martial arts culturally or through any lineage or anything like that. Let me make this make sense sooner. So what I did was I flip-flopped and I started teaching the application first. People would learn a technique and it's like, okay, that feels pretty good. Hey, take a look at this drill. Do this drill a few hundred times, then go back and do your technique. Oh, wow, that feels really good now. I feel like I'm much more skilled at doing that technique. Yes, the drill is what facilitated the repetitions that make you good at the technique. So it changed the order of presentation of the training process. For the people who never get to the point of doing the drills, who are just kind of dipping their toe in the water and say, I'm going to learn some knife stuff. Yeah, they never get good at it. They're like, I don't know if I can make this work. Yeah, you just haven't worked hard enough. You don't have enough reps. Mm -hmm. Once they get to the point of doing the drill and they understand the benefits of it, it pays big dividends. So for anybody interested in learning more about MBC or actually getting connected with an instructor, where should they go? MarshallBladeConcepts.com is, is my website. It's called Marshall like Martial Arts, Blade Concepts. Uh, if you go there, it's going to have lots of information. One of the th first things to do is to look at the instructor locator. So up in the, uh, the menu up at the top, look at the instructor locator. We literally have instructors all over the world. Uh, we have authorized resources of NBC all over the world. So the first thing to do, if you can get hands-on instruction, that's obviously going to be the best thing. It's going to allow you to learn much more quickly. You have somebody who's watching you critically, making sure you don't develop bad habits. You can also, if there's somebody who's not um, in your immediate area, in a lot of cases you can reach out to the closest instructor and see do they do any kind of a monthly event or a quarterly event or something like that. Do they teach seminars? Get on their mailing list. So even if they're not accessible for regular training, if you can still get hands-on training from them on a periodic basis, that's a great way to go. Um, and that also allows you to get involved in kind of the NBC community as far as social media, Facebook, all that kind of thing, and find out when there are training opportunities that are coming up. Um, obviously, seminars and stuff like that, next, be next best thing to any kind of a regular ongoing training. Uh, but one of the other things is the NBC Distance Learning Program, which is basically an online program. I produce new material for that program every month, um, and it is literally a living library of NBC material that is shot in such a way that it really facilitates distance learning. And currently we have more than 60 hours of material, adding new material all the time, and that is one of the best resources you can find as far as learning NBC and there's also information available on that uh, if you go to marshallbladeconcepts.com. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching this episode of The Knife Life. I will have links to Mike's website down below in the description. If you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing and leave your comments down below about what you thought. Until next time, stay safe and keep living the knife life.